Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief Parking Officer EMC, John Martin. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to day two's general session. I hope you had an absolutely tremendous day yesterday in day one. But for those of you who maybe had one too many pina coladas last night, let's just recap the highlights from yesterday. and meet the expectations of the information generation. It's my pleasure to introduce the CEO of VCE. So if you're an IT practitioner, the number one problem you're dealing with is primarily how do you deliver this next generation IT infrastructure while handling the tremendous amount of complexity. Last year, this audience, we raised over $300,000 in conjunction with charity water. Amazing. It's incredible to bring clean water to the 6,000 6, people in India. 6,000 people in India. Okay. Okay. Now today is Federation Day, and it is going to be a fun session, I can guarantee you. So kicking us off in just a few moments is going to be Joe Tucci, who's going to be walking through today's primary keynote. He's also going to be joined by a number of other members of the EMC family or EMC Federation of companies. We have Paul Moritz joining us from Pivotal. We have Pat Gelsinger joining us from VMware. We also have two special guests, two Federation customers, Dirk Ruger from BMW and Deb Gesmondo from NBC Universal, and a very special guest at the end here, John McGuinness, motorcycle racing champion and legend. Also kicking off today is the Global Partner Summit. So from 1.30 1 onwards today, if you're a partner, then please join us in the Global Partner Summit in Palazzo E. We also have Jez Humble joining us at uh, 3 o'clock in Venetian F. Many of you will know Jez as Vice President of Chef. He's going to be take, leading our guru session around uh, continuous delivery and lean, the lean enterprise. And then in the village, there is a ton of stuff going on. If you haven't explored this area, go check it out. As you can see yesterday, I had a blast here. Two things to remember that's happening in the village today. At 4 o'clock is happy hour. And then at 5.15 is the concert in the Commons. You've got to go check these guys out. They're really, really great. The other thing you may do, obviously you see the, uh, the presentation here. You see the virtual presentation. The other thing that we're doing is we're also broadcasting live from all over the place on Periscope. If you haven't checked out Peris Periscope, it's really probably going to fundamentally change the, the landscape of, of uh, the media industry. So go check that out. But with that, I would like you to give a huge round of applause to Joe Tucci to kick us off for Federation Day. Well, good morning. EMC World, how you doing? How was day one? 
You have a good time? You learn? Oh, terrific. As Jonathan said, today they've designated as Federation Day. And since we have this great live band, as opposed to a dead one, I guess, um, behind us, maybe you can, uh, Tom, maybe you can do some Federation music. Hold it, hold it. Stormtroopers. You're the bad guys. The Federation in this movie, am I right? They were the bad guys. So don't go away mad, but please just go away. Thank you. Not, not towards me. So Tom, can we try again some good Federation music, the good guys? That's better. Thank you, Illuminate. You probably all saw them. They did a great job on uh, America's Got Talent. I think it was in 2011. And of course, the Stormtroopers were volunteers from you. So those are actually people who attended EMC World and volunteered to do that, oddly enough. Um, <laughs> but again, uh, today it is my pleasure uh, to present uh, what we're trying to get done strategically in the EMC Federation or family of companies. And uh, you'll hear, uh, uh, my, my job's kind of light today. I'm going to kind of brush over, and then you'll hear the experts. You heard David Goulden yesterday, who runs EMCII, and you'll hear from Paul Moritz and, uh, and Pat Gelsinger today, right, after, right after, the, my, after my presentation. And again, you'll get a good feel of what we're doing. But let me um, sit, step back a second and just really welcome you uh, to EMC World. This is the 15th time I've had the pleasure of being on st a stage at what's now called EMC World. Uh, the first one back in 2001 was called Wizards Conference. How many of you were there in 2001? Probably not a lot, right? A few hands. And then we, went, then we called it Tech Connect in 2002, and then we went to the name uh, EMC World. But we kept our roots the same. This was, this was by our, run by our technical community for the technical community of our customers. And it makes this conference different and unique, and we're going to stay close to our roots. So welcome, and thank you all for being with us. We really, really do appreciate that, whether you're a customer, whether you're a partner, uh, we just value everything you do for us and with us. So thank you so much. There's an old Chinese proverb. Uh, there's a kind of debate of whether it's a curse or a proverb. But according to Google, it is a proverb and a greeting. So let me give you a greeting. And the greeting is, may you live in interesting times. I can cut that really short, because I can say without a doubt, congratulations, you do. You are living in very interesting times. And from an IT perspective, maybe even more so, I'd say you're living in unprecedented times. And what's really happening here is we're entering a new digital era. In my own personal opinion, this will be the biggest shift in, for every business across the world since the Industrial Revolution. And this could even be bigger than the Industrial Revolution. And as you see here depicted, you have this huge wave 
this digital era wave crashing down on business as usual. Now, as all things that are disruptive, there's a, there's a side to this wave that's opportunistic, and the opportunistic side is far bigger, far bigger than a disruptive wave. So within your companies, you're going to have to decide, are you going to get hit by the disruptive side of the wave, or are you going to ride the opportunistic side of the wave? And that's what we're focused on here in the EMC family of companies. How can we make sure we ride the, the opportunistic side of the wave, and how can we make sure that we help you? More importantly, how do we make sure you, we help you and your company and your business and your enterprise ride the opportunistic side of this wave? Now, what's in this wave, and this is really IT-led, uh, smart mobile devices, pervasive telemetry. You heard in David Goulden's slide yesterday, there'll be 30 million connected devices to the internet in, in, by the end of this decade. These are creating huge data sets, unprecedented amount of data. We are measuring data in zettabytes now. Uh, there's massive on-demand on compute and storage available that's affordable and it's incredibly agile to use. So these are the things that are forming these, these changes. And of course, what you as a business want to do is you don't want to get Google to death like Google did to the uh, advertising pages inside your local newspaper. Remember when your new local newspaper used to be this thick? Now it's this thick. They got Google to death. You don't want to get Amazon to death as what they did to the, some of the book companies. And you could go on and on. Uber is changing the whole liberty, liberty, uh, industry, liberty industry. You can see that Tesla is forming a new way to make and sell cars. And you'll see BMW and other great companies responding to this. And they, again, they, they need to get on their own and build their own digital agenda. So business imperative number one for all your companies is how, you got to go on the offense and become digital. Build a digital agenda. Now, when you do this, you've got to rediscover software, and you've got to rediscover the art of writing software. And these new digital apps are fundamentally different. Yes, they're all written for mobile devices first and foremost, but each app has about a thousand times more users than apps in, in, in the Platform 2 era. Each user has about a thousand times more data. So yes, that's a thousand times a thousand. This is a million times fold impact. So it's the, that just shows you how pervasive and how unbelievably opportunistic and disruptive this wave could be, will be. But again, you've got to be realists. And we know there are thousands of very well-functioning legacy data centers out there. And there are millions of existing applications that run in those data centers. And those applications and data center cost billions to build and deploy. And of course, they are generating trillions of dollars of revenues for your companies. In fact, without these systems, no company would be able to run today. Uh, almost virtually true, right? So imperative number two is you must transform IT, your existing IT. You must lower the cost to pay for this new digital agenda. And, and, and of course, you, that means how do you move your existing apps? How do you move to a different kind of infrastructure? And you've got to dramatically, you don't want to just do that and increase, to decrease costs. You want to improve efficiency. You want to improve agility. And you want to introduce innovation. For instance, you want to make sure that all your legacy apps work with mobile devices. So this is business imperative number two. And of course, the way to do this is to move to a cloud technology. In your data center, called the private cloud, in, in a data center that's managed for you by us or one of our partners, managed private, or of course a public cloud. And again, you can run it yourself, we can run it for you, and we can do that in partnership with our great e ecosystem of, of partners out there to help you do this at any stage here. And we call this a hybrid crowd approach. This is the best way to get ready for platform one and plat get ready for platform three in the new, new era and basically run this new 2.5 transition apps, moving, to, moving your existing apps to a cloud. So business imperative number three is the bad guys are out there. And the more things have become digital, the more surface area they have for attacks. So we need to do priority number three for all of you is to make sure we have a laser focus on cybersecurity. And here, we're kind of marrying what we're doing to basically say we got to get, we got to catch the bad guys in the act before this, this, this information gets stolen. And of course, we want to do, do intelligence-driven security analytics to understand what's happening now, change the course of action, and create a lot more security. Of course, this takes investment too. So what we've done, and you'll hear it today, you heard the part, first part from David, you'll hear now from Paul and then Pat, 
And this is, this is how we set up our federation of companies to attack those three business priorities. Help you build a digital agenda. Help you lower your costs and move to a cloud. Help you move to mobile. Help you make sure that you protect yourself from the evildoers out there in the cyber world. And you'll hear it. Rather than me repeat each of these missions, you'll see how we're focused. So these things snap together like business, like building blocks, very good, like great Legos. We're strategically aligned. But each one of these companies is very focused on a discrete mission. So we get the speed and agility of a smaller company inside a bigger company to help you with those three imperatives that you're going to have on before you without a doubt. Now to do this is, is not for the uh, faint of the heart. I and mean, as we do this, we've got to make sure that we uh, have a one core philosophy that permeates. As you move to these, these, these new uh, topologies, these new apps, you certainly want choice and you don't want to get locked in. So part of our pledge, and you'll hear it loud today, you heard it from David, you'll hear it from Pat, you'll hear it from Paul, is to give you choice and not lock you in. And of course to do this is expensive and needs scale. Well, I'll give you a little bit, a few dimensions of our scale. As, as you heard, we have about 70,000 people in the EMC family of companies. We have 21,000 in the go-to-market, sales, pre-sales, to help you make sure that we present the product services we have that are available to help you in your business. We have 16,000 plus engineers and developers innovating and writing software and hardware and developing hardware. We have 22,000 people in our services and consulting organization. And of course, that's way insufficient. We have a broad and deep partner ecosystem. We have partners that help us distribute, technology partners, service partners, and consulting partners. So when you put that together, this has a multiple of, uh, explosion effect on a number of people we can bring to bear to help you in your mission. Of course, we have a deep, deep stable of IP, intellectual property, and patents, and I could go on and on. If sufficient cash, and, this, and again, this is not, not an not a inexpensive thing to do. And to make sure we fuel it and stay a technology company at heart, I mean, hence you know, the Wizards concept, Technology Connect, now EMC World, we're a technology company. As David said, we're a people company in a technology business, but our heart and soul is around those people developing innovative technology. We invest 12% of revenues on research and development, we take another 8% off the balance sheet and acquire innovative technology companies. So we take an over 20% of revenues to invest it back to make sure we give you the innovation that you need and solutions you need to power your business. Now, of course, last year and again this year, if you add those two together at our size, that's more than $5 billion of investment. So we're putting our money where our mouth is, so to speak. We're backing our vision, our strategy, our federation of companies with sufficient cash and investment to make sure that we give you the, the tools you need to be successful in your mission in your companies. I just give you just step back. And over the last three, two years, two and a half years, we've, these are six companies that uh, we've either bought or invested in heavily. Uh, NSX for uh, software defined networking, AirWatch for mobile device security and management, uh, Pivotal, and you'll hear from Paul in a second, but Pivotal's basically a way to write your new generation of apps, deal with big data, deal with the cloud. Uh, we've got a set of software-defined storage assets we've been investing in. Uh, we've, you've heard about Stream.io yesterday, and you heard about DSSD yesterday, and you'll hear more about it through the show. So just to give you a little color, those six, those six investment areas cost us $6 billion off the balance sheet, cash to buy companies, to invest to make sure we're in those new areas, $6 billion. Last year, those, those products did about a $1 billion in revenue for us. And, and basically, we're putting so much investment, they cost us negative high teens per share in our EPS calculations. This year, those set of products will do $2 billion. So these set of products are grown at or a little slightly over 100%. And again, the EPS, we're still going to lose money this year, this time, this time low EPS per share. So these are kind of investments that we're placing to make a difference and put power behind our vision and our mission. And again, it's all for you. And, and, and that's why this conference is so important, and, and the technical important. side of this conference is so important, to make sure you understand what we're doing. We get your feedback of what we need to do better and how you can deploy it in your individual businesses to make a real difference and make sure that you ride that opportunistic side of that wave. So these are the uh, handsome gentlemen that are the CEOs of these five companies in the Federation. I use that term loosely, but um, I'm only kidding them. They're very handsome. And... Um, and you'll hear from each of them, so I'm not going down deep, but I wanted to kind of set a context of what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. 
So again, I want to end where I started. I want to thank you for being here. We know there's a lot of demands on your times. The fact that you come here to spend the better part of a week with us means a lot to us. We have the people here that can make a difference. We're not only here to present what we have, we're here to listen to you and make a difference, help you make a difference in your company's mission. So in, uh, in, in the, and one of the most rewarding things that happens to me is how you feel about us. And this past year, you rewarded us with our highest customer satisfaction and net promoter scores in our history. And I, I really want to thank you. So perhaps our management team, which is mostly here in the front, will join me to applaud you, our customers, and our partners for helping us accomplish this. Team? And by the way, we're not satisfied with those scores. We're going to keep raising our own bar to make sure we exceed, not meet, but exceed your expectations that you set for us. So again, thank you so much. And to help me say goodbye in the theme of the Federation, we have a special guest who I think, I think is 167 years old, a good friend of mine. You want to come out and say, help us say goodbye? Looks good for 167, doesn't he? And I don't know if you noticed, but Vulcans are very tall. Mr. Spock. Yes, sir. Mr. Spock. Can you send this crew off with any words of wisdom? Well, in conclusion, what Vulcans always say is live long and prosper. Thank you. Have a great EMC world. I look forward to meeting every one of you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Very special guest for us today. Please give a huge round of applause for Dirk Ruger from BMW. Yes, great to have you here. Great to have you here. So BMW, great customer of the, the EMC Federation of Companies. We just heard from Joe there around the transformation of the digital era that we're, we're living in. So at BMW, what, what, does that really, what does digitization really mean to you guys? Yes, first of all, a thanks for invitation here. Um, my name is Dirk Rüger from BMW Group in Germany, and I'm responsible for a department called Business Analysis After Sales and uh, Digital Processes. So what does it mean? On the one hand, we are looking for digital services for our customer, which basically um, based on car-related uh, or consumer-related data. As an example of this, we have an augmented reality app um, for our BMW user menus, which we launched this year in the US for mobiles. So our customers can easily take a picture of controls in the interior of the cars, from which he wants to understand what the functionality is or how it works. And we think that this is a cool feature for our customers in terms of convenience. So internally we use a computer vision algorithm uh, in order to detect the control and route directly to the corresponding item of the user menu. And then the content of the user menu is almost simultaneously shown on the on mobile. So just so I understand that, so basically you pull your mobile phone out, you just look at a component in the car, it put, you open your camera, it gives you a, an augmented overlay, and, it, and you've ultimately got like all of your instructions and your user manual for, for that component just through your phone. Yes, that's true. That's pretty awesome. That's good. Yes, uh, if we get in touch with uh, digital service like this with our customers, we have also the possibility to learn more about how our customers, what they like, what they dislike, or uh, what they expect from our products and services today and in future. So um, this is one topic. The other topic in our department is that we use processing of this data gives us ability to manage our business more proactively or more accurately. And both of these topics, uh, we obviously use this technology from Pivotal and EMC, um, big data, predictive analytics, and machine learning. That's very cool. All right, so um, 
obviously, as you, you're working through this digital area, you're, you're not really a technology guy, you're not an IT guy, you're a business guy, and yeah. you're really looking at um, how to engage customers in after service. So, so when you, you think about moving to this digital era, what, what are the biggest challenges that you're facing today? Yes, I think we have some challenges to face if we talk about digital services uh, or digital integration of our, in our car environment. So, of course, we have to handle data privacy very carefully with respect to our customer. Data protection becomes more and more important since we have bidirectional data from car to our backend systems and vice versa. But I think uh, the bigger challenge has to do more with synchronizing the different development cycles. On the one hand, we have the de uh, car development, and on the other, the IT development is very rapid. So um, traditional car development is um, usually measured in years, and the IT development is typically measured in months. So that means that we have uh, the development cycles of digital developments up to 12 times faster than the car development. And the challenge right now is um, if we have to integrate digital service in late car development cycles. So we have to find ways how we do this. Yeah. So bringing those two worlds together of kind of traditional car development, and you, when we were talking earlier, you were saying typically it takes about six years to develop a car end to end versus your kind of digital processes are taking six months, and how do you really blend those two things together? That's right, yep. All right, so BMW is always known as a company that's incredibly innovative. It's always known as a company that's doing a lot of really cool things, and we're talking about a particularly cool thing that you're working on right now around predictive maintenance. So do you want to just share a little bit about that? Yes, sure. Um, from the business perspective of after-sales, predictive maintenance pr project is very important for us for several reasons. Um, so the primary goal of predictive maintenance is to detect uh, malfunctions of car components in very early stage. So um, let me ex explain a little bit how it basically works. Um, as many of you expect or imagine, we run many sensors in our car simultaneously. They feed these data in so-called fault memories with diagnostic travel codes. And we have to find the right correlation patterns for the predictive analytics um, for all these fault memories to predict um, some malfunctions coming up in our cars and how they evolve and what are the consequences of that. That is a story about predictive maintenance and we implement these analytic algorithms in our cars as well as on the backend systems and uh, for the backend systems, we have also the possibility to enrich these data with external data, like uh, statistic data from our car fleet and temperature and so on and so on. And for the backend infrastructure, we use uh, the pivotal um, components from our central IT department, and it runs very well. That's cool. So you're bringing kind of streams of data from the cars, you're merging that with third-party data and you're using it to predictively analyze when my car needs to be serviced or a component may fail. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, Dirk, so thank you for sharing that with everybody on stage. Um, BMW, obviously, great customer of the Federation, so thank you for your partnership. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for joining us today. Thank and I'd like to now go back to the main stage. Yeah. And Paul Moritz, thank you very right. much. Good morning. It's uh, great to be here with you at EMC World again. I'm going to pick up on a theme that all of the speakers have been emphasizing, which is this notion of digital transformation. Uh, and yesterday, David Goulden put up this slide, uh, which summarizes a survey that they did of several thousand businesses around the world in terms of what are the priorities that those businesses see in terms of what's going to need to ensure their success in the future. And I wanted to look at these five uh, activities in a little more detail, because they're all about how do you deliver new business value in the future? How do you build a different way of relating to customers and build new business models behind those relationships? And of these five boxes, uh, two of them are what boxes. 
that what you actually have to deliver. There is the box that says deliver personal experiences. Relate to your customers in a fundamentally different way. The world is changing from a world where businesses used to spend vast amounts of money on advertising to drive customers towards them to a world where you have to build a compelling digital experience that pulls people in. If you look at most of the disruptive companies out there in the world today, Tesla, Uber, et cetera, they don't spend a lot of money on advertising. Instead, they focus on the experience that they deliver to those customers, and they provide, provide a compelling experience that provides useful value when you need it. And that goes to the second of these walk boxes, which is to operate in real time. Real value comes when you can catch somebody or something actually in the act of doing something and affect the outcome. And that's what's going to be radically different about this generation of technology from the past. In the past, to a large extent, we were automating existing processes, automating many of the paper-based processes that we had. In this new era, we're doing fundamentally different things in the sense of being actually able to interact with people wherever they are, whatever they're doing, in real time, with contextual and relevant information. So it's not only enough to be able to relate to your customers a different way, but you have to do it in a time frame and a speed that really makes a difference. And when we extend that to the fact that in the future, you're not just relating to people, but you're going to be relating to machines and being able to affect the behavior of those machines as they're operating, this ability to deliver new digital experiences and do it in real time becomes very, very important. Those are the things that you want to do to drive new business value. The other three boxes talk about the culture that you have to have in order to do that. You've got to be able to understand where this is going, spot those new opportunities. You've got to be able to develop and innovate in an agile way and gain the trust of your customers. So when you look at what's needed together, put together to do this, there are certain technical things you need to do, and then there are certain things you need to learn how to do in terms of how you operate as an organization, the type of people you have, and the culture that you build up. So two, digital transformation is difficult precisely because you have to speak to both the what and the how, to both technology and to people. And it's this understanding that has really guided us in Pivotal, in setting up Pivotal, which has been in operation for two years now. And we set up Pivotal as an organization to really lean into this opportunity for digital transformation and look at what you can do when you assume that you have a modern infrastructure underneath you. So in looking at Pivotal, we assume that our colleagues at the Federation, EMC and VMware, are going to provide us with a great modern infrastructure su substrate to operate on. They're going to provide us the means to reach down there and be able to ask for essentially unlimited and extremely cost-effective resources to drive these solutions that allow you to relate to people in context in real time. And in keeping with the ethos of the Federation of providing meaningful choice, we've also architected the pivotal solutions to not only take full advantage of the software-defined infrastructure of the enterprise hybrid cloud coming from VMware and EMC, but we've made sure that it can also run on other infrastructures out there uh, coming from other vendors in the industry. So Pivotal is really about addressing these two challenges of what and how. And we've broken it up into three value propositions that we offer. One of them is around how do you build a new culture? How do you develop in an agile way? How do you get the right people and processes that can then take advantage of an underlying architecture that can deliver the applications and the data that will power these new experiences? And in addition, keeping with this theme of choice, uh, we've made sure to anchor the technology that we're using firmly in major open source initiatives. So I'm going to unpack these three value propositions, the people value proposition around Pivotal Labs, the apps value proposition around Cloud Foundry, and the data around what we call our big data suite. 
Looking first at the people side of it, Pivotal Labs, when we set Pivotal up, we did something unusual. We incorporated into the company what we were thought were best of breed examples in how to do modern agile development. And uh, we acquired a company called Pivotal Labs, which is where we took our name from. And Pivotal Labs had grown up in Silicon Valley and become the premier developer of applications for many startups in Silicon Valley. Many of the applications uh, that you're using on your phones today were actually written originally, both front and back end, by the Pivotal Labs team. So we have now a 400 plus person team that is equipped to develop in partnership with our customers and share with them everything they've learned about modern agile development and how to build those compelling digital experiences. And what we found is there's tremendous appetite for this out in the marketplace. As Joe said, every business in the world is realizing that they have to participate in this digital world and that means delivering digital experiences to their customers. Those digital experiences have to be differentiated. By definition, this is not something that you can buy off the shelf from a vendor. It has to be customized and unique to the value proposition that's going to differentiate you and distinguish you from your competition. So businesses have to rediscover product development, and modern product development means rediscovering software development. So we found that there's tremendous appetite uh, to engage in this, and uh, we are set up to work with our customers. Our stress is not doing development for you, but doing development with you. So we invite doing development with you. So we invite customers initially to come into our premises, sit down shoulder to shoulder with us, form a common team, and start writing applications. And that way we can transfer everything we know about how to do that that can then be built upon, and the goal is eventually all that expertise gets taken back home, and businesses can have these gets taken back home, and businesses can have a modern, agile product development culture. Uh, we're doing this, if you're delivering healthcare today, you realize that you have to be both, not only in the illness business, but you have to be in the wellness business, because modern healthcare is all about preventing illness. And when you're in the wellness business, by definition, you're not interacting people when they're, they're in the hospital or in the doctor's office. You have to interact with people in their daily lives. That means building a compelling digital experience that can reside on their mobile phones, on their Fitbits, on all the other wearable devices, and provide highly relevant, timely, contextual information to affect the behavior of people to enable them to make smart choices about how they live their lives. So, We've engaged with very large companies in the traditional healthcare space who have honestly looked at themselves and said, we know how to build back-end systems. We know nothing about how to build compelling digital experiences. So we've said, let's partner up together uh, and work together so that we can transfer that expertise with you because building those digital experiences is not just a checkbox for you. It's going to be the core of your business in the future. This is not something that you can outsource to the cheapest developers uh, in whatever new location around the world that you can find them. This is really now the core of your company. So we're doing that, for instance, uh, in the automotive space. You heard it earlier from our earlier guest from BMW. A lot of automotive companies are realizing that the app is as important as the car. If you look at a company like Tesla, they worry as much about the app that they give to ride on your, to reside on your phone or in your iPad as they do about the car itself. Because in some senses they know that that relationship that they build through that app will outlast any particular car that you buy. And they want to have that direct relationship with you. So we're working with a large number of large automotive manufacturers around the world who similarly said to themselves, we know a lot about building cars. We know not a lot about how to build compelling digital experiences, and we have to learn how to do that, and learn how to do it very quickly. And we need to do that with somebody who's willing to really partner in a very deep way with us. So this part of our business is really uh, resonating with our customers, and uh, we have this value proposition that it's not about doing it for you, it's about doing it in partnership with you. <laughs> of course, we need to do that modern agile development on the right substrate. So when it comes to building the apps, 
and deploying the apps, we want to put that onto an operating system, using the term very loosely, that allows you to fully exploit the underlying infrastructure, to tap into what this modern cloud-oriented infrastructure makes possible, which is access to lots and lots of very powerful, inexpensive compute resources and lots and lots of very powerful and extensible and scalable storage. So we want to allow developers to focus on building those apps and not have to be either locked into underlying infrastructure or worry about the details of the underlying infrastructure. So in keeping with providing meaningful choice and building a broad ecosystem, we have anchored our offering there on an open source project. And it's not only an open source project, but we've actually transferred the core intellectual property into an industry foundation, a nonprofit foundation. Uh, so we've surrendered control over the core technology to this foundation, which is governed in partnership uh, with partners like IBM, SAP, Intel, and others. So there are over 40 companies now who are coming together to become custodians of this platform to give the industry a secure and open base to build upon in the future. We take that core technology from the foundation, which we contribute to, and we take it back and we fashion it into a distribution that we call Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Uh, and that's based upon the open source, it's a subscription model. And what it allows you to do, using, again, an imperfect but useful analogy, is to take what you used to do on top of traditional servers, all of that soup of middleware that you would have to put together to run your applications and all the complexity of managing it and learning how to operate it. And you can essentially replace all of that with a single integrated runtime that sits on top of the new hardware, which is the cloud. This takes the ops out of DevOps. It allows you to just have your developers focus on what they need to do, gives them all the services they need, and does not lock them into any underlying cloud, gives you the option of being able to deploy on-premise, off-premise, in public cloud A versus public cloud B. So this is what Cloud Foundry does, and it provides a simple business model for that, so you can replace many different contracts, different metrics, with basically one price per app, independent of the underlying cloud that it's running on, whether it be a private cloud or a public cloud, render A's cloud or render B's cloud. So we're also finding tremendous resonance in customers who like this approach, who want to be able to lean into the future, who don't want to be locked into any particular underlying vendor, who want to be aligned with the ecosystem that a well-functioning open source project provides uh, and be able to build securely for the future with that. Uh, by way of information, uh, we'll be, uh, week after next is the uh, uh, Cloud Foundry Summit uh, in San Francisco. So those of you who are interested, we, we'll be 11 enterprise customers talking about their usage of Cloud Foundry at that event in uh, San Francisco. On the data side, similarly, we need an architecture that will allow us to capture all of the information that's going to be necessary to power these experiences and be able to reason over it in real time. The only way you can do that is by tapping into what the cloud now makes plentiful, which is lots and lots of machines and lots and lots of storage. What's different about the cloud as a computing architecture from previous generations is you as a developer can now ask for as many machines as you want. 100 machines, 1,000 machines. You can ask them for the next 30 minutes and then give them back. So we can now pull information into the memory spaces of those 1,000 machines, have them work in parallel in order to do the processing, the heavy lifting of sorting through all the data and delivering the insights in real time, in the time that they are needed to actually affect the outcomes. And when I say real time, I'm talking about seconds or subseconds here, not minutes or hours. You can't do that on traditional data architectures. There's no relational database in the world that can do that. You've got to go to a scale-out, in-memory approach. So putting Pivotal together, we pull together technology that allows us to offer a suite that can deliver the ability to reason over very large data sets in real time using a cloud architecture. 
In keeping with this theme of being based upon a broad ecosystem and open source, we have based our solution on what we call the Open Data Platform, which is a group uh, of 11 vendors. It includes ourselves, IBM, Hortonworks, Teradata, and a whole bunch of others who have come together to provide a core binary standard for what's called Hadoop. A lot of you know Hadoop is an architecture that allows you to approach data in a scale-out way. But to date, Hadoop has really been 15 different open source projects, all of which live under the auspices of the Apache Software Foundation. But it's been left up to you to basically curate how to put these things together, or left up to individual vendors to decide how to curate them, put them into a package, and test them. What the open data platform does is guarantee that when you get a Hadoop solution from one of the members of the open data platform, the core of that will be binary compatible. So we're achieving in the Hadoop world what has been achieved in the Linux world, where many vendors have different Linux distributions, but they make sure that the kernel of Linux is binary compatible. So that if you get a third party product, you can be guaranteed that it will work on that binary compatible core. So what we're doing with our big data suite is allowing you to take this highly fragmented world of data where you've got information living in different places and different architectures, and over time, put those into one place based upon a open and uh, freely available core, the open data platform core, and then add on top of that the semantic capabilities that will allow you to reason over that data at scale and in real time not using new, just using new techniques like MapReduce, but familiar techniques like SQL. And in particular, what we bring to the party, what we Pivotal bring to the party on top of that common Hadoop core is no holes barred, highly scalable SQL. So we can take SQL, paralyze it, and run it directly against the underlying Hadoop core. And we offer a variety of functions that we believe that you'll need over time to do full justice to the data that you will be collecting. Again, we try and make it easy to buy based on open source, but based on a, a simple pricing model for any or all of the components, mix or match. So you don't have to be worrying about many different business models from different vendors. So that's the pivotal contribution. And of course, we'll make sure that that big data suite runs as a service on top of Cloud Foundry so that you have the uh, option of deploying all of that either on-premise, off-premise, in one cloud or another cloud. So Pivotal's uh, contribution in this place contributes directly to the federation solution that we call the business data lake. So the EMC, we're working with EMC and VMware to make it possible for you to get everything you need up and down the stack to be able to create a repository where more and more of your data can go and reside and where you can reason over it using modern cloud-oriented techniques, and we call that the business data lake. So in closing, then, what we're trying to do is to look at this incredibly rich substrate that our federation partners are providing us with, the software-defined data center, the enterprise hybrid cloud. This is the new hardware. These are the mainframes of the 21st century that you'll be able to get in many different forms, as Joe Tucci said. People well, Federation will offer to you on your premise for you to ma manage. They'll offer it to you in a managed form, on or off premise. They'll offer it to you as a public cloud, et cetera. But all of that is going to be available to you. The question becomes, how do you turn that into business value? And that's where Pivotal comes into the picture. So to discuss some of the themes here, I'd like to uh, invite a good friend of mine and a close colleague of mine, John Rose, who's the CTO. Uh, of EMC to come up and join me, and uh, we're going to have a discussion and a chat for a few minutes. Hi, John. It's a long walk, Paul. <laughs> I know. So, John, one of the interesting I th uh, challenges I think business have is as they think about transformation going into the future, 
the key is to do it on top of foundations that are, on the one hand, going to unlock the functionality, but not, on the other hand, lock them into a particular vendor and, uh, or a particular approach. So I think this idea of picking an architecture for the future as opposed to picking products for the future is really important. And I know it's something you've been thinking about, sir. If you wonder what your thoughts are. Yeah, sh sure, you know, I mean, it's, it's absolutely critical. I mean, you know, we're in the business of building clouds and, you know, everybody is putting clouds out there, but clouds have a purpose and that's to run applications. And in the third platform, it's very likely that your applications will run on a diverse set of clouds. Now, that's all very obvious, but the reality is, what can you do to make sure that that application doesn't get trapped in the wrong cloud, that it becomes portable? And while there's product choices you have to make, because we're talking about a very complex ecosystem, many different vendors, lots of different topologies, the real decision people have to make is which architecture is going to allow for that openness. You know, t two years ago, I asked a bunch of customers what they were scared of in the third platform and in the cloud world, and the number one issue was lack of portability, being locked in, not being, to be a not being agile because the infrastructure was too tightly coupled to the immediate problem as opposed to the long-term strategy. So architecture is fundamentally the, the, the right question to be asking these days. Now, I, I invited you up here because uh, you're playing an important part in Pivotal's future, not only uh, in your role as a CTO of EMC, uh, but you also happen to be uh, the chairman of the Cloud Foundry Foundation, yes. uh, which is this organization, as we said, of uh, uh, a whole bunch of competitors, actually, in some sense, who've come together to yeah. rally around providing a, a secure foundation for the future. Yeah. And uh, it is based on open source. And I would like you to comment, really, on the thinking that's gone into the governance of this technical asset going forward. And, and, and if architecture is so important, how are we going to shape this architecture going forward? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, uh, obviously my, my, my full-time job is the CTO of EMC. My part-time job and becoming much more of a, a time, time constraint is uh, chairman of the Cloud Foundry Foundation. But the Cloud Foundry is unique and actually I, I consider it to be kind of the gold standard of, of very complex open source initiatives because we didn't just say a bunch of people have a shared vision around cloud portability. We basically said, how can we make sure that we make sure we implement that successfully? And so the governance is, is much more rigorous and complex maybe than, than other initiatives have been because this is so critically important. And it starts with, you know, not just having random contributions, but having a discipline about how we actually develop the technology. In Cloud Foundry, for instance, we don't just allow ad hoc contributions. We use a, a rigorous development methodology with paired programming. And we actually, EMC is the first, uh, is, is helping to create the first Cloud Foundry dojo outside of Silicon Valley to train people on the methodology to make sure that we're using modern development techniques to build a modern platform that will be able to stay ahead of the demands of the market. And all of this rigor initially kind of scared people, but what we're hearing from both customers and the participants, which is actually becoming a very large group of uh, customers, suppliers, et cetera, is that that level of rigor actually de-risks it, assures the architectural consistency, and likely is going to make it a, a very, very strong component of the future. I think one of the interesting things about the governance model is, on the one hand, that, that is that rigor, but on the other hand, it is in some ways a fundamentally more open process than a lot of others because there are many open source projects that are de facto controlled by a core group of committers, yep. and they're kind of a self-perpetuating entity. Uh, so if one company employs all the committers on an open source project, de facto they have control over it. Whereas in Cloud Foundry, what we've done is actually define a technical track whereby any individual who's willing to put the time and effort into it can earn the right to become a committer. Yeah, it's a 100% governance by contribution. If you're not contributing, you can have an opinion, but you're not gonna shape the future of Cloud Foundry. And to be perfectly honest, it's created an ecosystem, which I've never seen, where you have a, a host of very uh, aggressive competitors. Uh, you know, IBM, HP, EMC, Pivotal, I, Intel, SAP, big companies that are competing in the market, but within the Cloud Foundry ecosystem are comfortable that it's the merits of the technical work 
and the commitment to the project that will shape it, not the politics and the, the macroeconomic issues and the other things that tend to derail open source projects. So it is a fairly unique uh, uh, experiment, but I think it's one that actually is a blueprint for future large-scale open source projects. Well, I wonder if you'd like to comment on the other major open source initiative, uh, uh, which is the open data platform. And there it's a little different because in Cloud Foundry, essentially we had to create that movement from scratch, whereas uh, in the data space there is already this very, very big movement around Hadoop. And uh, I wonder if you want any thoughts you have on what ODP is bringing to an existing open yeah. source project? Well, I think ODP and, and many open source projects, uh, Hadoop being a good example of this, tend to fragment um, because of either a lack of governance or otherwise. And, and what we hear after they get commercial success is customers actually want to know what the core is. What is the center? What are the things that will be consistent across distributions? And that, that can change over time, but having a conscious effort to try to create that open core in which the core interworking is guaranteed is critically important. In fact, uh, you know, ODP is tasked to do that, and I think that's why most of us are involved in it. But we're actually seeing similar activities in places like OpenStack, where they're asking the same question of, do we want fragmentation? Or do we want a consistent core with differentiation around it? And you know, I think those are the right models to pursue. And quite frankly, you know, the good news about the Hadoop ecosystem is while it's a very popular technology, it's not massively adopted yet. We're at the early stages. So getting that open core right and making sure that we have consistency and interworking in the core essence of Hadoop is going to be critical to basically de-risk the future of that technology, which is so important to big data and analytics. Well, great. I think uh, they've got another customer now to talk uh, about their experiences. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. right. Thanks, Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome champion and racing legend, John McGuinness. So, uh, welcome to UMC World. Yeah, thanks to the warm reception there. Yeah, that's, that's great. Oh, yeah, good, good. So, 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 you are definitely a bona fide legend. You are uh, not just in your own sport, but I think in the motorcycle world overall. You are uh, a road racing champion. Uh, you're racing many, many races. Probably the most famous of those is the Isle of Man TT. Um, for the people in the audience that might not be familiar with the TT, do you just want to give them just the, the two-minute kind of flyby of what it's like, actually like to race in a race like that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a special place. I mean, it's a little uh, island in the middle of the Irish Sea. It's, uh, it's a 37 and three-quarter mile track with over 250 corners. We get up to speeds of uh, knocking on the door 200 miles an hour. We, we average the track at uh, 132 miles an hour on these bikes next to us. And, uh, you know, you've got bumps, you've got jumps, you've got a mountain to climb. We've got all sorts of uh, obstacles on the side of the track, like walls and trees and lampposts and so many different types of uh, tarmac and manholes. and. So, yeah, it's a time trial, about 90 riders, so it's a special place. And and it, it's a yeah. two-hour race as well, so yeah. it's a, a very tough race. It's truly, truly, truly insane. So you've been racing for 25 years. You've won the Isle of Man TT 21 times. 
You are, without doubt, the king of the mountain. You're the first person to break the 130 mile an hour lap record. The big question, why are you so fast? Uh, maybe it's something to do with the size of my testicles, maybe, but uh, I don't know. But, uh, I was, uh, I was uh, sort of hoping, hoping uh, you guys were going to help me along with it, but with, with the help of this, this data analyst that you, you, know, you guys have been working with, it's been, uh, it's been fantastic. You know? yeah. We've, uh, we're getting to learn where we have you know, our, our weak points and strong points, and we're marrying them all together. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll make us faster and, and, and safer. But we, we're not allowed to tell anybody else, so this is no, just for a Top we're secret. Not, we're not allowed to tell the competition. So. Yeah, so when we got to, to, got to know John, we figured out that this actually sounded like a, a big data problem. So we went out and we worked with a, a company called Alpine Stars who built this fantastic suit that you can see John wearing here if you want to go and model our suit, John. So th this suit, it's a biometric suit. It has hun a, a couple of hundred sensors inside it. And then we built uh, this bike here as well. And the bike also has, is instrumented with a ton of sensors to allow you ca to capture everything from kind of lateral G, your banking an angle, acceleration, braking, et cetera, et cetera. So then we put John and a second rider, um, a guy called Adam Childs, who's also a TT rider, on a track in Spain. And we gathered uh, during that session over 700,000 rows of data of not just what John was doing and what the bike was doing, but primarily the interaction between the two of them. We open, so we open source those two data sets of the, the control rider and of John. And today we have about a thousand data scientists around the world that are trying to figure out why John is so fast. We're going to use this data to try and make uh, the motorcycle industry safer and also to give John an edge as he comes towards racing in the Isle of Man TT in just a couple of weeks. So we're, we're a few weeks away. Um, how are you feeling about it? <laughs> yeah, I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, fantastically excited. Got some great bikes, great team, uh, you know, new sponsors. So, you know, it's my, I think it's my 20th TT in a row. So hopefully we can add to our tally of wins. Uh, but yeah, there's nothing can sort of prepare you for the TT. You know, it's only a few, few weeks away. But uh, as far as that, I'm ready. I had a wrist injury last year, but I'm strong now. I'm uh, motivated and I want some, some more wins. Awesome. So we're gonna, you're able to follow John um, as he goes to, is on his journey towards the TT. You can follow him on emc.com. Uh, we're going to be using the same bike, the same suit at the TT, collecting the first ever data set from this race. John's going to be down in the Solutions Expo at 1 p.m. today. So if you want to uh, meet, meet the legend, do the book signing, get your photographs, he's a very, very congenial guy. So he will spend, take a bunch of time with you. So thanks for joining us today. Now, I know I, uh, I've kind of been busting to have a go on this bike all week. So how about I give you these and you go take a seat down there and I'll take this. You right. be careful, Jonathan. All right, thanks a lot. Careful. No pressure. <laughs> Safety no first, but get me helmet on. Very good, thank you. It is a pleasure to be back here for my sixth EMC World. Three of those as president and COO for EMC and products, and now as a guest for three as the CEO of VMware. And thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be back here in Vegas with you all today. You know, as you look at this uh, picture, and some of you might know, I you know, started life as very humble roots as a farm boy in uh, Pennsylvania. And this is a picture of some of my uncle's farmlands there. And we have this little stream of uh, the Tobahawken Creek that crosses between them and a bridge to get from one side to the other. And trust me, you know, all day long you're going back and forth across the uh, bridge. And that's very much the environment that we're in today. Right? We're in this environment where you know, VMware has created extraordinary value, extraordinary agility and cost savings for the client server generation, but it's also the core underpinnings for the mobile cloud era. And all of us are operating across these two worlds, and we need to bridge across those two worlds to leverage the assets, the databases, the identity systems, all of those things from the old environment 
but also combine them with the emerging applications and capabilities of this new world. We need to bridge between those two worlds, and we need the architecture that allows us to cross over and leverage the investments of the past as well as in the future. For that, right, we believe that you know, it's time for a new model of IT. And as we've talked to many, many customers, and personally I saw over 700 customers uh, last year, right, we see these three themes consistently emerge. Instant, that you know, what used to take weeks or months of provisioning a system, now it's expected to be immediate. Right? It needs to be fluid. We need to be able to reallocate resources and systems across those environments. And it must be secure. And we simply call that brave new IT, an optimized environment for the rapid development and delivery of the applications onto any device that's safe and secure. Now, it isn't just about building that environment, but it's also enabling you, the IT practitioners, to be brave in your environments as well. Because when the CEO or the business leaders are looking around their table, and who can they look to to guide them in this era of digitizing their business, of setting the course for the next business? Well, of course, they're going to look for the smartest tech guys around the room, and that's you. It isn't just to be the operation of IT, it's to be the leader of the business transformation, to be brave to change each and every one of the businesses that you represent and are part of for the future, or brave new IT. Against that, we've developed an architecture. We simply call it one cloud, any app, any device. One cloud where we need a common cloud architecture that enables on-premise, managed, and public cloud across a common set of ingredients. We call that the software-defined data center, virtualizing compute, network, and storage and delivered through a pane of management or automation. We have to ruthlessly automate every aspect of data center operations. Once we've created that common layer of abstraction of virtualization, we can now transform the underlying infrastructure. We can go from a build-your-own environment to converged infrastructure and now hyper-converged infrastructure as well. On top of that, it needs to operate for any application. It needs to be able to continue to optimize and operate today's apps, but also be the framework for tomorrow's applications as well. And finally, we have to see it delivered on every device. It has to be able to operate on the PC devices, Macs, but also this explosion of mobile devices as well. Any application on any device. Now, as we spend our time together this morning, I want to frame the rest of my comments around three industry imperatives. And against these three, then, put the key technologies, the key initiatives that we have against each one of these three imperatives that we'll cover in our brief time together this morning. And the first imperative for that is simply the hybrid cloud isn't a stop along the way to an all-public cloud world. It is the environment of the future. IDC estimates that today, you know, less than 10% of our application and infrastructure runs in the public cloud. By 2020, less than 30% runs in the public cloud. You know, this environment by inertia, but also by cost, by, by uh, governance, by the requirements of different data responsibilities, SLAs, all of those will keep an environment that has both on and off premise, the hybrid cloud, is the future environment. It is the world that we are building. We have to have the bridge built and architected for on and off premise operation. And that is the world that we will live in for decades to come. And against that, that's exactly the architecture and what we're pursuing with vCloud uh, Air. And we've really seen that the purchasers and those operating on it really are seeing these two different models of how they operate. One is, is that inside out, that they view the cloud as an extension of their on-premise environment. And things like disaster recovery or burst capacity of existing applications, but it also is outside in use cases as well. Well, you know, we don't want those tested dev guys in our data center, so we'll move them, those crazy guys, to the public cloud. But then as test and dev completes, because it's fully compatible with my on-premise, I can bring them back outside in consumption. And it really is these two operating in conjunction that makes the hybrid cloud so powerful. We can move seamlessly into that environment, and we can move seamlessly across 
and back into our own premise-based environments as well. And that's done by a common underlying architecture, the software-defined data center, and it enables safe, easy, and quick consumption of cloud resources. This model is getting strong adoption in the industry, and this is a short list of the thousands of customers that are now running on uh, vCloud Air. And we see across these, we see you know, startup companies, companies that, you know, you know iatric I, I, I and creative solutions and custom windows, companies that you know, are really saying, hey, I'm an enterprise desired company and I need enterprise class infrastructure as I build my new business areas. But it's also strong and powerful brands as well, brands that you well know like AMC, who are doing test and dev of the new apps to build their next generation movie going experience and being able to bring those and deploy those on premise. Or companies like Nielsen, who are building their next generation viewer analysis services and being able to provide scalability of those applications and services. Or a company like SAIC, one of the largest government contractors in the world, and they are uniquely taking advantage of vCloud government service. Or another like Express, one of the fastest growing retailers in the world today at almost $2 billion. And you know, for them, performance is absolutely critical of their cloud resources, but they need the security, right, the PCI compliance, and being able to operate their data on premise, but being able to burst their capacity in the cloud. And the seamless connection and transport across those has been absolutely critical for their use cases. So strong brands, startup companies, who want to be able to act like a startup, but be able to deliver like an enterprise, the power of the hybrid cloud in action. We're also dog fooding ourselves, or as the Europeans like to say, drinking our own champagne. We're, we are in the process of migrating to SAP as our next generation ERP uh, environment, a financial environment for the company. We're going to be running that on vCloud Air as we productionize that for our own business operations at VMware. At VMworld this last year, we had a, a you know, the VMworld uh, a mobile app for the VMworld conference. And, you know, fortunately, you know, I talked about it in my keynote and voila, you know, demand spiked immediately. We used our vRealize operations tool, saw the demand and spike, and quickly scaled that application uh, using uh, vCloud Air. If any of you today are using the EMC World application, you're running on vCloud Air right now. If you're running the EMC World app uh, right now, you are part of the VMworld vCloud Air ecosystem right now. So we've looked at imperative number one. The hybrid cloud is the future. Second imperative, IT teams focused on assembling the piece parts are destined to fail. As we're looking to this mobile cloud future, fundamentally, our IT focus needs to shift from looking down at how we build the infrastructure to looking up at the applications and the business transformation that is underway. And this is causing us to shift from worrying about how the server hooks up to the switch and we integrate to that management console and increasingly saying, how can I take those set of solutions that are being made available, quickly productize those, so my focus can shift into the applications and the business process transformation that is required in this digital future? And several aspects of that. One is, this is the thesis behind our software-defined data center strategy, where we're bringing right, our compute, network storage, and management into a complete suite of capabilities so that we are engineering how all of those pieces fit together so you don't have to engineer inside of the data center. You know, we've just had a tremendous first quarter of launching refreshes and integrations of almost every portion of the VMware product line. vSphere, our flagship core compute product, 650 new features, you know, exciting new capabilities like long distance uh, vMotion and native fault tolerant capabilities, you know, things that are simply breakthrough capabilities. I'll touch more on our network and virtualization capability. We rolled out our software defined storage, including vVols as well as updates to vSAN. And finally, major extensions to our management uh, product line. And as I mentioned before, the way you operate a cloud 
private cloud, managed cloud, or public cloud, is you ruthlessly automate every aspect of the data center operation. And that is primarily done through the management tools and building those environments through those management consoles that increasingly enable that full automation of the data center environment. Now, once we've built that software-defined data center, we can now transform the hardware underneath it. And this is the opportunity of converged infrastructure. First of those is the appliance delivery vehicle. And this is the Evo Rail initiative that we've brought forward that says from power on to operation, 15 minutes, and we're able to have this being able to provision virtual machines. EMC has stepped up in a powerful way through vSpecs Blue to deliver this into the marketplace. And this, for the broader set of ecosystem partners, as Joe said, a broad set of choice for the industry, a key new capability for appliance level delivery of converged infrastructure. Earlier this year, we saw the rollout of VX Block. And for this, combining the capabilities of the V Block with next generation networking and NSX uh, capabilities a full delivery of the SDDC with the value proposition that, VM, that EMC has so artfully created through the VCE vBlock uh, coalition and delivering that in a powerful way into the marketplace. Yesterday, you heard David Goulden describe right, the VxRack effort, not just having scale up embodiments, but scale out data center level uh, CI solutions as well. And this is in uh, alignment with the VMware strategy around Evo Rack. And you'll see us bring that together as part of VMworld 2015 in the uh, August timeframe this year. So we're quite excited as you see this complete alignment across the CI efforts of EMC as well as VMware. But it gets even better. And what we've done through the Federation Enterprise Hybrid Cloud is combine those hardware elements with the complete SDDC elements that I've described, but also predefined services and workflows and full integrations with our vCloud Air capabilities to deliver a full solution stack to the marketplace as well. And we see this idea of the Federation Enterprise Hybrid Cloud as even a further delivery of us taking and doing that engineered integration work that allows you to say, I'll just buy it, and it just works, and it delivers a complete integrated value proposition using the best of breed components from the Federation companies, further enhancing the capability. And finally is our VMware integrated OpenStack offering. Now, this is very interesting, because you know, this whole idea of the open source, open movement is this bubbling cauldron of innovation and new ideas. And the question is, how can we combine that innovative energy with rock hard enterprise solution requirements as well? And this is exactly the thesis behind VMware integrated OpenStack, where we're utilizing all of the vSphere features, things like HA and DRS and SRM, and not compromising on those, enhancing it with our management tools, but also layering on top of that the OpenStack APIs, enabling these open frameworks to consume that infrastructure in more powerful and flexible ways. In fact, I was just reading last night, I got a mail, a very well-known uh, brand had just spun up their VIO environment, and within three minutes, they had 300 VMs up and running through their VIO environment that they just stood up. You know, and they were just thrilled that this would have taken them weeks, if not months, in their old environment, and now with VIO and the rock hard solutions, literally minutes, they were being able to provision new uh, VM environments for their operations. Further, VIO will be extending it through our Federation Enterprise Hybrid Cloud offerings, so a full range of converged and hyper-converged opportunities. You know, the VX rack uh, technology that David spoke about yesterday will be a delivery vehicle for this as well. And you hear Jeremy talk tomorrow about some future CI solutions for which we'll be working together in the OpenStack and uh, VIO offerings as well. So the third imperative. This careful balance between the open, innovative community and the need for rock-hard security. And how do we navigate through those worlds? It's very interesting that our network 
virtualization technology. And the person who led this work for us, Martin Casada, he actually had the thesis for much of the work right, that emanated from security. He was at NSA for a decade. And he said, the only way that I can solve some of these security problems is to rethink the network. And that was the thesis and the invention of open flow and network virtualization. And out of that came NSX, which were proving you know, as significant as ESX. And I think of NSX in 2015 like ESX was in 2005, transforming the network in a fundamental and architected way. Incredible agility, streamlining of operations, abstracting of functions, enormous benefits. But it also allows us to attack security. And this is what is so exciting. We've seen this micro-segmentation of about half of our NSX customers are specifically buying and deploying it specifically for the benefits that NSX and network virtualization enables for full performance, fully distributed, in-kernel firewall function. So you can imagine at the point of ingress and egress of an application, you're now able to exercise firewall rules before the packet even touches the wire and be able to you know, pass or not. And for complex firewall rules, be able to, in an integrated way, reach out to best of breed firewall components with a consistent policy management layer to deliver unparalleled levels of security, security that was never possible in the past, now being done through this power of network virtualization and technologies like distributed firewalls, a fundamental breakthrough in IT security. We're also then combining that with capabilities like AirWatch. AirWatch, you know, just tremendous success since we brought that into VMware, revolutionizing endpoint security and management capabilities, but we're also integrating it with the NSX technology, so literally we can extend microsegments all the way to the device, as well as being able to use things like per-app VPNs and combining high-resolution endpoint security with full network transport all the way to the delivered virtual machine that's enabling it. You know, again, fundamental breakthroughs in security. And the last of our technologies here was our cloud-native security announcement that we did a couple of weeks ago. Clearly. There's exciting innovations occurring in this idea of cloud-native application development. Many, many ideas, new technologies emerging. And against that, we announced LightWave. Now, LightWave, we've taken the core identity and access management technology that you all have been running for the last several years. You know, it's just embedded inside of vSphere and the full vCloud suite, and we've now taken it and offered it into the industry as an open source project as a scalable and integrated into the container and cloud native world as an identity and access management technology. Lots of excitement and enthusiasm around it and bringing world class security into cloud native environments. We're combining that with NSX, again, doing a deep integration of those capabilities, as well as what we call Photon a lightweight container optimized secure minimum footprint operating system to deliver a next generation security architecture for the next for the cloud native development world taken together a powerful set of technologies at our core for vmware we look at ourselves as fearless innovators just time and time again we're doing things 10 or 20 percent better that's not who we are we're about radical steps of innovation, fundamentally changing through infrastructure software how the data centers built, operates, and scale. And against that, we simply say that our job together is that we can innovate like startups with that same passion and aggressiveness and speed of innovation, but we can deliver it with rock hard, secure, scalable infrastructure like an enterprise. Thank you very much for the time together.
exciting. You need to play the game better. We are going to have some amazing sights and sounds for you. Yes! All right, ladies and gentlemen, Ooh, hello. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back uh, for the final special guest of the day. We thought we'd bring the love over to this side of the hall. So please give a huge round of applause for Deb Gismondo from NBC Universal. Thank you. Now, many people in the room are going to be very familiar with, uh, with NBC Universal. Um, we learned a little bit more about them for the video, but you just want to tell them a little bit about kind of your role. Absolutely. Thanks, Jonathan, and thanks, everyone. Um, I've been at NBC Universal for just over a year. It's been an unbelievably incredible experience. We saw the real there, the kinds of content, the excitement that we do in terms of the content we provide, but also on the technology side. We have film, we have television, we have news, we have sports, we have our parks. And I have the privilege to serve as the chief architect overseeing the technology tr transition across that entire portfolio. So I work very closely with our business-aligned CIOs to ensure that the technology that we're bringing to the organization is there to support the needs of the business. Awesome, awesome. So, um, like many industries, media industry undergoing massive, massive transformation as we move into this digital era. So do you just want to talk a little bit about what the, how the technology organization can kind of help that transition? Yeah, that, great question, Jonathan. And again, we provide compelling content, and that's truly our belief in terms of the media, the film, the sports content that we provide. And as technologists, it's our responsibility to make sure that we're providing the technology and the platforms to, to, to distribute and to consume that content in any way that the, our customers want to. So for example, if I'm at home and I'm watching TV, I want to stop that program. I want to move that to my tablet or my mobile device, and I want to take that in the minivan so I can keep the kids quiet while we're going to the soccer match. Or if I'm, I have a text from news, I want to see breaking news. I want to sit on the, on the subway and know that perhaps there's a traffic delay. I want to see that kind of content come to me in real time. And again, it's our responsibility as a technology organization to provide those platforms to support that consumption model. That's awesome. OK. so. You are using a lot, you're, so at the same time you're kind of, you know, trying to reduce costs, we're going to talk about that in a, in a second. Yep. You're, you're definitely in this digital era ch chasing growth. You're heavily utilizing analytics and predictive analytics. You're heavily utilizing and developing next generation applications. Do you want to talk about a little bit of your experiences there? Absolutely, and I think it was last week, just last week, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about our use of Pivotal and, and uh, our work with Pivotal Labs. We're just about to go into the upfront. It's basically where we sell the advertising for our next season. In the past, we didn't have the visibility across our portfolio to understand the demand, to understand uh, the, the inventory, which is obviously critical. You can't sell what you don't have. So we weren't able to do that very dynamically, and the work with Pivotal has been very instrumental in helping us have a broader perspective of our portfolio. It's also helped us consume some of the demand side so we can actually predict what our, our ad sales might be for the following season. So it's really given us a richness of insight into our data. That's awesome. All right, so that's kind of one side of the equation that David talked about, about chasing growth. The other side is around how do you reduce cost and how do you maintain or continue to develop your service levels. So you've been when, uh, working on a hybrid cloud strategy. So again, do you want to just share your thoughts on, on where you're at with that? Sure, absolutely. So I'm a absolute believer in cloud. Mobile first, cloud first for everything that we do in terms of our technology. We, as most companies, have legacy applications. So it's a, it's a bimodal strategy in terms of moving those enterprise applications into the cloud, into that modern architecture. But it's also making sure that we do all of our development thinking cloud first. It's absolutely critical that we do that. 
That's yeah. awesome. And then you've kind of taken that to a whole new level yeah. because you've become one, an early adopter of the Federation Enterprise Hybrid Cloud solution. Yeah. So what are your experiences of that and what have been the outcomes so far? Uh, a great question. It's still early days, absolutely still in sort of piloting phase, but I'm very excited about, about it. As a technologist, what I'm excited about is that you've given me an engineered solution versus a collection of products that I have to worry about integrating. You've done the hard work for me, and I can do the fun work of making sure that our applications, sort of the workloads that we bring to that platform, are, are brought to that platform in a technology, uh, you know, a robust way to support the growth needs of our business long term. All right. Well, that's a great way to close the event for today. Thank you, like Jonathan. To say thank you thanks very so much, much Jonathan. It's been great. And thanks thank very you much everyone. to all our speakers. We'll be back same time, same place, but don't miss tomorrow, 10 o'clock. You'll see what's happening right now. Thank you.